There's six women that will talk to you tonight about who they are, what they do, people-powered innovation. This is the theme, and this is Poshmark Superpower. I kept telling people about my dream, and I truly believe that that's why it happened, because if you don't speak up, no one knows, right? There is a very distinct culture within Poshmark. We lead with love. We trust each other. We believe in supporting each other. All of our sellers, they have their own story. How can we possibly create a brand around our story? She kind of did the same thing that me and Angela did. She's like, hey, you know, I love what I'm doing, but I want more. When you start to accept people for what they are, life just becomes simple. And how do you incorporate that into the product development and innovation? One of our core values is to get behind our sellers get behind our community and make sure that we're empowering them. It's like everyone else, I also had a career change. I actually had four. We've started that conversation and we're going to really help chart her to her dream. Don't settle and just go for it. How did you decide your values and how did you decide what kind of brand you wanted to put forward? Markets themselves are just these experiences within the product that make it easier for people to connect, sell and shop by what's important to them. Have that conversation with yourself, like what is my superpower, so that you can carry that with you and just know, no matter what, I can do one thing better than everybody else. Ready to clean out your closet and make cash while you do it? Poshmark is the number one way to buy and sell fashion. List anything from shoes that don't quite fit to a dress you've been photographed in one too many times in just 60 seconds. Ready to find all the styles you love? On Poshmark, discovering the perfect look is simple and fun. Love your purchase? Leave the seller a love note to let them know. Join millions of people across the country who are buying, selling, and sharing fashion they love. Right, and that's the most Poshmark promotion you're going to get for the night. Um, okay, so I'm here. I get to kick us off. And so after welcoming you, welcome again. What I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about me. I'll do that pretty fast. Um, and then share what people-powered innovation means and why we chose that to be the theme of the evening. And then we'll just kick it out to all of the amazing speakers that you'll hear tonight. I believe there's six women that will talk to you tonight about who they are, what they do. Um, when we talked to the panels, everyone wanted to share um, a tip that they've done or um, something they've done in their career that they really wanted to share with the group. So we'll talk a little bit about, about tips um, and try to have a whole bunch of fun doing so. Okay, so to kick it off, my name's Tracy. I'm one of the co-founders and I head up a new department at Poshmark we're calling New Markets. Uh, my background, I grew up in the East Coast, so I'm still kind of an East Coast person, um, but getting more and more West Coast as the years go by. I started in science. I was a science geek. I loved reading about brain and behavior. I moved into 
fashion pretty early on because I loved building brands. And obviously now I'm in technology. So my one thing I wanted to share with all of you is you can switch industries. I get this, I get this question a lot. It's hard. So you have to really want to do it. But if you want to do it, you can do it. And I'm happy to answer questions later about some tips on, on how. But the first, first thing I'd say is you can do it and you have to believe in yourself. And uh, I've done it twice and who knows what happens to me. I'm still pretty young and have a lot uh, to look forward to. Um, okay, so now about the theme of the evening, people-powered innovation. The reason that this is the theme is this is Poshmark's superpower. What I mean by this is this is the one thing we do that we think we do better than anyone else. And we wanted to share with you how we're thinking about it and what we mean by it, because I think that maybe you can take some of that into your own lives or into your own careers or, or in how you think about innovation. It might inspire you a little bit. So that's why we're choosing the theme is just really talk about our strengths and the things that we're really proud of. So people-powered innovation to us means three things. The first is, and then the video kind of alludes to all three of them. The first is we built our entire business off of people. Um, we call ourselves a social commerce platform. And what that means is we take people and we insert them into all the important parts of commerce. We think that all of us have stories to tell. We tell them differently. That's part of the beauty of photos and words and, story and stories. So we want to put that back into commerce. We think that there's more to selling a dress than seeing it on a hanger at a store. You know, so how did she style it? How did she feel when she was wearing it? Things like that. We think that's really important. So we put people back into the conversation of commerce, and then we build an entire platform around this so that people, anyone, any one of you, it sounds like we have some postures in the room, but really anyone in the world can become a seller, no matter what your experience, um, how much money you have, uh, whether you've done it before or not, all those things are relevant. Anyone can be a seller. And so what we see now is we have 40 million registered users, about 6 million of them have become sellers, meaning we're one of the largest selling networks in the world. So raise your hand if you're a Poshmark seller here. Congratulations, you're one of 6 million people in the US that are selling on Poshmark, um, including a lot of us here. So congratulations, so that's number one. Um, the second thing is you can't build a people powered platform without the people. So the second thing we did is we built a community. And what that means is we focused day one on really taking a look at our users and doing everything we can to support them. And, and so saying, we are behind you to help you build your business. And we encourage our community to talk to one another in case we can't be there to support you, support each other. And so not only does that happen in physical venues like this, but it happens in events that we hold in our app, like in our app, so a mobile event. Um, it happens in the conversations when you're on Poshmark. Um, and then it happens offline as well. So a lot of times we'll see Poshmark users talk to one another. They met on the app and then they talk to one another um, in real life. And that to me is one of the most beautiful things about um, why I love coming to work every day, it also reflects in a lot of our business metrics too. So for example, um, every day a Poshmark user spends 30 minutes on Poshmark. And for those of you in commerce who think about these kind of metrics, or and maybe some of you are not in commerce that think about these kind of metrics, that's unheard of for commerce. People don't spend 30 minutes talking about shopping elsewhere. And maybe nowhere. So people are, are not just talking about transactions on Poshmark, they're also talking to each other as human beings. And that's where we like to spend our time. That's how we find extra minutes in the day when we've had a long day, is to have a human connection. And so in so many ways, we feel like we've built a really large marketplace and a really large platform, but also a really large pl place for people to come and to connect with people either that they know really well or that they're meeting for the first time. So that's the second piece. And then the third is Team Posh. Um, so there's some of us here tonight. Uh, Team Posh is really all we have. We don't hold any inventory. Uh, it's all people and then a lot of code that happens uh, and a lot of packages shipped around. But um, there's 400 or so people that are part of, part of Poshmark that really make everything go round. So we spend a lot of time thinking about 
uh, how we can innovate in this realm and really keep people happy and motivated, creative, and eight years into the business still feel like they're learning new things every day. And so I'm really excited to kick this off. We have five people coming up to share their story, get into some specifics about the innovation that they're seeing and the stories that they have. Um, so with that, I'd like to bring up our next speaker. Can I go ahead? I'm going to go ahead and do it. Okay. So our next speaker is Barka. Um, she's our chief data officer here and officially one of the coolest women at Poshmark. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Is everyone having fun? You know, I was telling Tracy that I'm always bummed when I go after her. She's such a fascinating speaker. So just, I'm just raising the, I'm basically making sure that nobody has very high expectation. I'm going after, after Tracy. Um, so just about a little bit about myself, um, Barka Saxena. Um, I'm Chief Data Officer at Poshmark, have been here for five years. Uh, but somebody was asking me, I was talking to that, hey, this whole data thing didn't exist 10 years ago. So what did you do then? I was like, yeah, it's true. This whole word data science didn't exist, but I have been literally doing this. This was my first job out of college. I studied statistics. Numbers is what I have known my entire life. Uh, I spent my first 10 years at a company named FICO. Uh, I was a data scientist there. I started as an individual contributor, moved into management role, then I spent some time in product management, sales, and corporate strategy. After that, I spent a couple of years in advertising industry, still focused on the data, building data products for advertising. And then um, I had my second child, and I thought I will take a little bit break. Uh, and in like in two weeks break time, my husband someday one day comes and he says, hey, I heard about this really cool startup. They have these virtual parties, which is called Posh Party. And maybe you should go and meet with them. And I was like, okay, it doesn't hurt to meet, right? So I found a connection to Manish and I met with Manish and Manish said, we had some conversation. And then he said, hey, you should come and meet with Tracy. You just met with Tracy. Once you talk to Tracy, there is no going back, right? So here I am, five and a half years ago, I joined Poshmark, is still here and having a lot of fun. When I joined Poshmark, it was really, uh, the, the driving factor was people. I met with Manish, Tracy, Chetan, Gautam, our founding team, and honestly, it had been a long time, like being in the tech sector, I had not meet, met so many smart, but super humble people. So I, and then from being a data geek, this aspect of I'm gonna be working with mobile, social, and commerce data, it can't get any better than that. What I didn't understand at that time was when you are putting this social and the commerce together, it's a totally different beast than just thinking about the social network and just thinking about the commerce. So, so Tracy explained the social commerce from the vision perspective, but I'm a data person, right? So I have to understand it from the data angle. So how did I understand the social commerce and how I, started to understand it's really not putting two plus two four, really getting them together is we are making two plus two seven. And the way it works is uh, from the data perspective, right? When you are selling, you, what are your goals, right? You want to uh, acquire users who will come and buy stuff. So at Poshmark, you build your follower network. You follow people, they follow you. And by that, that way, you are basically fanning out the impact, the people who are going to see your merchandise. Then how do you market inventory? So there's a whole aspect of sharing which happens in the platform. Everyone who is successful in selling at Poshmark knows that you cannot be successful if you're not sharing. So you're engaged in sharing not just your item, but you also share other people's items because when you share somebody else, they will share yours and you are basically just expanding the network of the people with whom you're sharing your item. So you market your items. But then after that, you have to close the deal. How do you close the deal? You have to engage with your buyers in conversations. So there are conversations happen in the platform around fit, style, color, and then Poshmark has built all these tools in the service of community through which you uh, send out offers in a very personal, personalized manner to all these buyers, and that's how you close the deal. So sellers are very vested in being social in the platform because at Poshmark, that gives them an advantage to drive more social you are, more successful you will be. 
Now, from the buyer's perspective, the, the reason you want to be so socially engaged, because when you follow people, it's exposing you to a larger and larger merchandise, which means you are looking at so many items from where you can buy. So you are getting exposed to the styles of different people. You engage with the seller because uh, you want to be able to understand the merchandise beyond what just the description is telling. Like if you think of the reason the whole social commerce exists, because just like reflecting back, right? The 15, I mean, people who are a little bit older, right? If you think of the way the commerce was done like 15, 20 years ago, um, I grew up in India. And a lot of of time when we went for shopping, we will just go back to very those limited number of shops. But it was fun to go because you will go and talk to the person who is selling and that person will know which grade you are in, what you're doing, what's happening at your home. And, and there was fun in those conversations. As commerce became very efficient with the e-commerce and access to a lot of inventory uh, and fast shipping, it was all very efficient, but it took the fun away of that personal conversation. And what we have learned at Poshmark is people actually like to connect and talk to each other. So buyers, when they engage with sellers in the conversation on, hey, will this dress look good on me? Or like, because, you know, the same dress size can be different in different brands. How do you figure out it really fits you? So you engage in the conversation and you're figuring out. Buyers do a lot of liking activity in the platform. And that's because by doing like, you are creating this uh, sort of your wish list of the items you want to buy. By doing the activity, you're also building the connections with the seller. So when seller is ready to make an offer, there is a way for seller to reach out to you. So that's how, like, when I started looking at social commerce and the numbers started to explain why this social is truly driving the commerce, it wasn't just, hey, we are the commerce platform, let's do the social. The way, I mean, this is the genius of the founding team who built this amazing platform, social is so integrated with the, uh, the commerce that the two actually drive each other. And with, that is what has g- given us such a unique advantage that we didn't just try to bring the two pieces together. We built them interlinked from the day one. And when you build that kind of platform with the types of numbers Tracy was sharing, like 40 million users and five, six million seller stylists, 18 million shares per day, Think of the amount of data we are collecting. Like we have 30 plus terabytes of data, 400 plus million events logged every day. You leave a data team in that kind of environment, it's like the wonderland for people. So my team is so excited. Like we work, it's a cross functionally. We work with multiple teams and we are solving problems across the aisle from uh, working with the marketing team on different types of user acquisition problems working with Leanne's team in helping out how we can serve our community better, working with Tracy's team in figuring out how can we la- help them launch market. It's, there's so many problems teams are solving. They get to work with humongous amount of data. They get to use different types of data technology and the tools to build out the solutions, which creates business value for our community. And just to bring it back to that, it's, I mean, I, my team is, I mean, I'm very lucky to have such a fantastic team, which is just building all these awesome solutions. But the reason all of us are so engaged in doing all this wonderful work, going back to what Tracy said, this is just a wonderful place to be. Like the people are, I don't know how many have noticed our core values, but this is, I have worked at multiple places. This is the first place where I would say we actually live by our cultural value. We focus on people, truly on people. You heard Tracy, the whole conversation started on people. We lead with love. We trust each other. We believe in supporting each other. We embrace all weirdness. That is one of the the core value. Honestly, even I use it in my personal life. Like when you start to accept people for what they are, life just becomes simple. And then together we go. So we are so vested in each other's growth that it just makes this place this beautiful place. With that, let me invite, can I invite more wonderful people you guys can meet with? Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to make them nervous. Um, We're just gonna, you know, get excited, get loose, let's go. Uh, Okay, so first question. 
Can you introduce yourself a little bit about what you do at Poshmark so everyone has context um, of all the amazing things you're going to say after that? Yes. Oh, microphone on. Okay. Hi, I am Angela, um, and as Claire mentioned, I am the Associate Community Operations Director, um, and so my team uh, works under the community umbrella, and what we do is actually support all other areas of the community team uh, through data analytics, uh, product knowledge, and training. Hi, I'm Vanessa. Um, I'm Senior Director in the product team, and I run the Core Experiences team. And when I say Core Experience, what it means is the buying, the selling, um, the social interaction, um, working with our power sellers, our new sellers, um, any uh, international expansion, um, and then also like market expansion as well. Hi everyone, my name is Camille Ford. I work on the new markets team and the markets team is really focused on driving expansion into new business areas. So what that looks like could be developing a new category, launching multiple markets within the product alongside Vanessa's team uh, or expanding into new departments as well. Hi everyone, I'm Adrian. I'm a software engineer on the growth team. Um, what does that mean? I basically work on projects to bring in new users to our platform, whether that's like an influencer project or just any like fun new things, new features. Okay, so I know it was pretty fun to hear from me and Barca, but these ladies have the real uh, stories that you want to hear about. As I was hearing earlier about what you guys are wanted to share, um, I just thought it was great um, content to share with, with this group here. Uh, so no pressure. Okay. Um, so we talked a lot about, in sorry, I'm being really goofy. It was a cr <laughs> crazy day today. Um, we talked a lot about innovation um, and I kind of talked about it at high level. Barca talked about it at high level. Um, can you guys really bring it home? Like what does innovation look like to your day to day? Is there an example of something you've done recently, for example, that you think it was just a really cool project to work on because it involved innovation and or something around people. I think that would be great for everyone to hear. Uh, who wants to go first? Adrian, you want to go? We'll go backwards. Um, so um, a good example of innovation um, was we basically wanted to bring our influence, we wanted to bring the influence, influencers I work with on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. We wanted to bring them onto our own platform rather than going through a third party. Um, so that was one of my first projects, starting from helping the product manager all the way to doing the tech spec um, and actually executing on the code. And one example of innovation is in order to like see you know, the level of influence someone has, we have to have some sort of metric, you know, so we know how much to pay them for, for posting on Instagram, for example. And instead of going through their API, because there was a lot of um, stuff going on Instagram and they're saying they're taking away their API, we decided to actually just use the HTML code and get their stats that way. So I think that was um, a really fun example because the first thing, if you're familiar with software, the first thing you usually do when you talk to different companies, you go through their API and we decided to just bypass that completely. Uh, so, innovation question is interesting because I feel like throughout my career, I've always tried to think about how can I do something different, right? Um, but at Poshmark, I feel like that question gets tipped a little bit. It's how can we do things differently using social as a tool, using uh, technology as a tool. And so, I feel like working on markets for the past six months is a really good example of that. Uh, and so markets themselves are just these experiences within the product that make it easier for people to connect, sell, and shop by what's important to them. Uh, and in many ways, it's just a layer on top of Poshmark's existing platform, but really digs into the social piece, which is brings it back to people, I think, at the end of the day. And so uh, for me, from working on uh, markets and figuring out like how can we get people to shopping experiences that are relevant, uh, it's almost like this backwards thing where through markets, we're now enabling people to shop the way that they used to shop. So if I only want to shop luxury and I want to go into a luxury store and I want that like real time feedback on, cert on a certain thing, I can get that through the luxury market on Poshmark. And so to me, that's like an interesting full circle view of innovation around like, how can we use the tools that we have to kind of bring it back to its core? 
And so just working on launching markets over the past six months, I think now we have roughly 25-ish markets, has uh, been an interesting experience for me with regards to innovation. Yeah, so many years ago, we launched a feature called Offer. Um, and what that feature is, I don't know if you, any of you, has anyone used it? Raise your hand if you've used that feature on Poshmark. Yeah, so it really mimics um, normal behavior, right? You're there, like think about the olden times, right? You'd go barter and negotiate. And we kind of bring that to life in the app. So what we did um, last year is we launched a feature called Offer to Liker. Has anyone ever liked an item on Poshmark? Has anyone um, had a listing and gotten likes on Poshmark? Yeah, so it's, it's an amazing feeling, right? You know that these people are really interested in your product. Um, and so all this, like, all, you're getting all this love for this product. And so we thought, you know, why don't we use that energy to the seller and help them? So what we launched is Offer to Liker and where you can um, give a private discount to the people that like your item. And uh, that's been amazingly successful for us. You know, we've just used kind of you know, normal behavior and we've used that organic behavior and we've amplified that through our product. So, Awesome. So um, kind of echoing some of the things that you've heard, uh, Poshmark is social commerce platform. Um, and so on the app, people are uh, commenting and communicating with each other on listings. Uh, they're liking, um, they're communicating and building bonds with each other through buying and selling. And so from the very early days at Poshmark, we actually saw that um, these users, these poshers were, um, as Tracy mentioned, getting together outside of the app as well, very organically and just meeting up. Um, there's actually a term uh, that has been coined for someone that's a friend that you meet on Poshmark, that is PFF, which is Posh Friend Forever. Um, and so as you can tell, these bonds are lifelong, right? Um, and so we saw this and we thought, okay, this is really, again, the lifeblood of Poshmark. We are all about the people and spreading the love. And that's the only reason all of us are here today. So uh, we came up with a type of event called a Posh and Sip. And the Posh and Sip is a posture-led event. Um, and these postures are finding the venues. They are inviting their friends, their family, their PFFs to get together and not only talk about Poshmark, but also just build upon these bonds and uh, make more connections and really grow and empower each other. Um, and so I think to me, that's something that's super exciting because we get to uh, see them meet all over the country um, and just get together and uh, just kind of continue what they have on the app, but in the physical world as well. Okay, great. So we talked a lot about innovation. Um, and if you guys want any more, feel free to ask. They've all agreed to stay for the Q&A because you can't leave. We're doing a Q&A right here. And then after, if, if you have questions that you want to do in private. Um, now I want to talk about uh, you as, as people, right? Um, you have so much experience um, that I think is so interesting. It was really interesting to me to hear it. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to everyone else in the room, uh, mostly because we're all so different, right? Our stories are all so different. And so can you share um, a, a little bit about how you got to Poshmark? And if there's, and with that, is there anything you did along the way that kind of helped you get into the role or any tip you have? Um, I imagine anyone here uh, either now or in the future might be looking to make a change in their job, for example. So if you have any tips on that, or you might want to have a job. So if you have a job or any tips on how to be successful, it's just you are um, four really successful women. And I think I'd, I'd like to give a little bit of the floor to that. You want to start, Angela? Yeah. Um, awesome. So I actually have been at Poshmark for a little over six years now. And so um, I found Poshmark through a friend who um, still works here. And uh, we were friends through middle school and high school. And she heard that I had graduated college and was looking for my first big girl job. Um, and she was on the community team here and said, hey, you should come interview. So I did. 
And at the time, we had basically one role, which was community associate. Um, and through that, you know, we wore a lot of different hats, as is typical at a startup. Um, and from there, we kind of started to build into different teams. And so from there, I moved into the support team, um, still under the community umbrella. And I did some management for a couple years. And through that, I noticed that I started having more and more of an interest in our KPIs and our SLAs. And I wanted to know why are they the way they are? Um, how can we make them better and to really understand them on a deeper level? And so I started speaking to my manager and Leanne, our SVP, and just letting them know, you know, I'm really interested in this. I would love to move into more of a data-driven role. Um, the time wasn't right, you know, right at that moment, but I kept telling them and I kept trying to get into projects that I could kind of dip my toes into the analytics area um, until the day came when Leanne approached me and she said, okay, the role's here. Let's do it. Uh, so I happily went to that uh, more of an analytics role on the community team, which was awesome. I got to stay with my community family um, and did that for about a year. And then Leanne approached me with another opportunity and said, hey, let's build out this team. Uh, so now I have the three areas. I have a data analytics team, a product knowledge team, and a training team. Um, and so, you know, I've learned a lot over six years, right? Um, I, I've learned that you can't just uh, keep your dreams to yourself. I think something I really believe is whatever you think about and you talk about all the time is what you are or what you will become. And so I was very open, you know, and I, I kept telling people about my dream and I truly believe that that's why it happened because if you don't speak up, no one knows, right? So um, if that's my little tip, I would encourage you all to just be very open about your passions and your dreams. That's so amazing that, Angela, you knew your dream and then went and told your boss. That's so vulnerable, right? That's so scary. Has anyone here done that? Told your boss you want a different job or you want a different, you know? Any, anyone who wants to do that? <laughs> just kidding. I love my job. I was just trying to get people. Um, uh, yeah, so if, if you're one of the people raising your hand, come talk to her because she did it and uh, sounds like it worked out for her. So, Vanessa, you want to go? Cool. Um, so, when I graduated college, the economy wasn't great. Um, and I was just applying jobs everywhere. I was hanging out with my unemployed friends. It was really fun. But my parents were like, <laughs> you need a job. And um, me being a geek, like many of you guys, um, I saw a job posting. I don't know if you guys have heard of CNET. They, you, you know, they review electronics. And I love electronics. They do a lot of cool tech stuff. It's in San Francisco, super fun, right? Uh, and I got a job there, which is amazing, right? Um, and it's at a big company, you know, it's like, wow, that's really cool. But, you know, I started my job and I was really bored. Um, it was just something, yeah, it was a job, but it wasn't something fulfilling. Um, but then, you know, I got immersed and started talking to people and I got involved in helping building tools for that team with engineering, um, so I, I uh, was kind of doing product management for the back-end tools, and, but I wanted something more. Um, so like Angela, I actually went up to my VP and very, um, you know, more like a, hey, you know, this is something I'm already doing. What can I do next? Like, how do I prepare my self? Um, do you have advice for me? Do you have input? And he was very open and receptive and um, pretty much immediately he was like, let's craft a role for you, which was amazing. You know, I did not expect that. I came to kind of talk to him, building a case, not sure what would happen. I definitely was really scared, but he was very receptive and um, I got the role as a project manager to help build internal tools. Um, but deep down, I really wanted to work on the user side. So I was building tools for the shopping team. Um, so that was my kind of first step into shopping, which kind of leads to where I am at now. Um, and so then, you know, I, I was in that role for maybe about a year and then an uh, internal opening opened uh, to be a PM for CNET Shopping and CNETshopper.com and I applied. And um, what was great about the people at CNET is that they were so supportive my manager was like, hey, yeah, go, go talk to that hiring manager. And, uh, you know, we were able to work through and I was able to transfer into that role. 
And then um, I was there for several years. And then um, it kind of leads me to Poshmark where uh, my then boyfriend was like, hey, um, there's this job opening at this company called Caboodle. And Caboodle is um, our CEO, Manish Chandra's um, first company that he started. And I just applied. I was like, okay, this seems pretty cool. I'm already doing something in shopping. This is social shopping. This is pretty new then, right? And, um, and then I applied and I wasn't sure about this whole thing because it was still pretty new. Social shopping was a pretty new concept back in the day. And then um, I applied and then, um, and then worked there for several years, um, went on with my journey in product management to many different companies. And then um, I had kept a close relationship with Manish and he's always been my mentor. And then one day he's like, hey, what about joining Poshmark? And I was like, yeah, of course. This seems natural, right? To work with people um, you really trust and you really admire. Um, but coming full circle back to my role now, uh, just a couple weeks ago, someone on my team, she came up to me and she kind of did the same thing that me and Angela did. She's like, hey, you know, I love what I'm doing, but I want more. Can I talk to you about it? I'm like, yes. She's like, so the first thing she said was, sorry if I'm being aggressive. And I stopped her right there. I was like, you're not being aggressive at all. Like, I welcome this. Please, please feel that you can do this anytime. You know, I'm here to help you fulfill your dreams. Um, so we've started that conversation and we're really helping her. We're, we're going to really help chart her to her dream. It's amazing. That's I'm going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting next to her. Um, so there really are some interesting themes here. Um, I also graduated when the economy wasn't doing so hot. And I felt like, what is the responsible thing to do now? Go be an accountant. Uh, and so my team teases me now because I call myself a recovering accountant because that's exactly what I am. Uh, but I started my career about 10 years ago at PwC. Felt like that was the right thing to do. That was a safe thing to do. I had student debt. Uh, but it was like not the right thing for me at all. Uh, and about a couple of years into doing that, after I felt like I had a good foundation around uh, financial services, I was auditing at the time mainly VC funds and, and private equity funds. I also then went to my boss <laughs> and said, I, I'm not happy. Like I, I like it here. I like the people. I like the culture but I don't like the work that I'm doing. And I feel like there's a part of my brain that's withering away because I'm not doing anything creative. And they, they helped me. They helped me find a new role. And so I moved into a marketing function where I felt like I could get some different functional expertise and something that felt like I would be able to still use the analytic side of my brain, but also um, use the more creative side of my brain as well. And, and, it, and it was a really great learning experience. But after a little while, I also felt like, okay, what's next? This, this isn't quite, quite enough. Um, and so I made the decision to move from the East Coast. I was in Boston at the time, go Bruins. And I moved to the West Coast to attend business school. And I was really intentional about my time uh, during the MBA to just like one, unlearn all the stuff that I didn't feel like was for me because I told myself, you are an accountant. You are only the analytical person. Who are you to think that you can be creative? Who are you to think that you can find both of those things in one job and be happy? Who are you to think you can work in fashion at all? Um, and really open myself up to the possibilities of what could be. And so I spent those two years just doing a lot of internships in fashion tech and just retail and trying to just learn everything I felt like I didn't, I didn't know. Um, interestingly enough, I had been a user of Poshmark for several years. Actually, before I moved for business school, I sold all my stuff on Poshmark uh, moving across the country. And... It was right before I was about to graduate. I look around and a lot of my classmates have these fancy jobs. They're all set. They're enjoying all this traveling. And here I am still recruiting up until the day of graduation. Uh, I'm looking at Danny back there because I got a call from the Poshmark recruiter on the day, the morning of my MBA graduation. And I thought he was going to say, Camille, we have an offer for you. 
he didn't. Uh, <laughs> instead, he's like, Camille, we don't have something for you right now, but like, we still want to stay in touch. And that was a little heartbreaking, to be honest, like going into graduation, but still stayed the course. And a week later, which actually was on my 31st birthday, got a call from Danny again. And this time it was like, Tracy's ready to make you an offer. <laughs> uh, and I, I share that level of detail only to say that what got me through like one, switching these functions, kind of keeping the momentum up when I felt like I wasn't necessarily getting to the place that I wanted to be in the time that I wanted to be it, uh, to get there rather, is just this layer of tenacity um, and just going after it and knowing that like you are totally worthy of whatever it is that you think that you can get because the opportunity might not present itself right now, but it definitely will. And so just staying the course that you feel like is true and natural to you and not being nervous that like, hey, I've invested all these years in like financial services. Like that's what I'm an expert in. No, like now I'm an expert in social commerce or like going to get there, right? So just being really honest and with yourself and not giving up on yourself, it would be my, my best advice. That was amazing. <laughs> Um, so like everyone else, I also had um, a career change. I actually had four. Um, so it's, I guess 10 years ago, I was in school. I was um, in structural engineering and undergrad. And while well, I really liked um, like calculating forces and making sure things don't fall down in buildings, um, I ended up getting... Too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I still like every time I drive over a bridge, I'm like, I hope this bridge like doesn't shake. But... <laughs> It's always in the back of my head. Um, but so I ended up actually taking a job in civil engineering with the city of San Francisco, um, interned there for public works. Uh, really, really boring. <laughs> we, I, I worked on sewers and sewers are very, very boring. They like fall apart every 100 years. There's not much thinking involved. So um, I went back, went back to school, got a master's in engineering management because I wanted to learn more about the business side, the people side of things. And then after that, I actually went to Verizon. I did a four-year rotation program and that was really, really cool. I got to do four different jobs in four years got really great training with executives, seeing how they run a really large company. But telecom was also very boring to me. It's like there's only so many cell phone towers I can design. They all look the same, not very challenging. <laughs> so I shifted again. I decided to become a product manager. And luckily, um, a girl from high school was a recruiter at a really small startup of 55 people at the time. It was in the cancer research clinical trials space. And so that was really interesting to me because I actually was pre-med for a hot minute in college. So I was like, oh, let me go back to healthcare. Um, as a PM, though, I was doing internal tools, and I don't think that was the right fit for me. And also, the management there was just a disaster. And I think the most important thing I learned out of that is it doesn't matter how cool the space is or how cool you think the product is. If the people, if they're not the right fit for you, then go because you'll find someplace else better. So that, um, so after going through that experience, and even though I was like, this is such a cool like company, I was like, this is not the right thing for me. So I walked away and then I decided to go into software as I did a boot camp. It was a three-month boot camp, 100 hours every week of coding. It was the hardest thing I've had to do, harder than uh, structural engineering undergrad because it was all crammed into one. But I came out of it absolutely loving it. Met up with a girl at a new restaurant opening. She's actually there, Christina. <laughs> because we do food influencing on the side. And so she was like, I work at this company called Poshmark. We're always hiring. I'm sure we have software engineer openings. Uh, why don't you like look? And so I took a look. Um, I decided to apply. She referred me and like, I just absolutely fell in love with the culture, the people first. And then it happens that the product is also something, you know, I love and I use as well. So it's like best of both worlds. Um, so I think my tip is, I guess first, you know, if it's not the right fit for you, don't be scared to move. Um, for me, I moved four times for different companies, but, you know, just don't settle and just go for it. Thank you for sharing your stories. You guys, can you give them all just a, yeah. Amazing. So I'm going to ask one more question and then I think we're going to open up to Q&A. Um, 
So those of you who know me, and there's a lot of you in the room, I'm a huge believer in superpowers. So I just gave Poshmark a superpower, which is people-powered innovation. Um, and what I mean by a superpower is that there's there's typically one thing that you can do that you know you do better than everybody else, right? And if you're lucky, it's useful in your personal life or career, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and so I think it's really... Um, sometimes you don't know what it is and sometimes it can change. But I think it's really helpful to have that conversation with yourself. Like, what is my superpower? So that you can carry that with you and just know, no matter what, I can do one thing better than everybody else. And I think that's great for confidence. So I wanted to, um, this is one of the questions I snuck in there. So I'm not going to call on anyone, but if you want to volunteer and, and share with us your superpower, my hope is that if we share, then if you don't know what yours is, maybe we can help, you know, pull it out of you by sharing what, what ours is. So I'll just start. Um, I didn't know this until a few years ago, but I think one of my superpowers is that I'm really good at telling stories if I care. And I'm really bad at telling stories if I don't care. And so going back to like career stuff, I have to do things that I care about because then I do my best work. Um, so I think my superpowers, I, I'm a good storyteller. Anyone want to share? I know this is a superpower, but I can literally talk about food forever, <laughs> which is like, it's how I got this job. It's how I got the job before this one. Um, it's great because like this company loves food too. So it just works out. And I guess I'm like a super taster. So I'm just very sensitive to like ingredients as well. So I'm the kind of person sitting at the table and like asking the waiter, like, what exactly did you put in here? Oh yeah, yeah I did taste that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, my superpower, uh, I would say that I'm really good at building relationships with people, not like massive amounts of people, but if I like find my group, like I, I can really build deep relationships with them. And it certainly served me at work, um, given that the market steam needs a lot of other people to get things done. But uh, yeah, it's just, it just played a, a big role in my life to be able to like put myself in other people's shoes. And it's funny because my friends tell me I'm a good listener. My mom tells me I was the worst listener as a child. So I'm not exactly sure how to reconcile that. But um, other than kind of going this back to this point around caring, like I, for the people that are around me, I, I care a lot. Um, and building relationships has been something that I found I'm pretty good at. Um, so for me, I don't know if this is a superpower, but I think this applies to how many moms are out there? Yeah. So I'm a mom to three young children. Um, they, I have three girls. Uh, they're all under the age of five. So uh, I have to multitask um, like crazy, right? My husband has a really busy job too. Um, and so I think that carries on to my personal life, uh, to my work life and personal life. Um, I became super efficient as soon as I, after I had my first child. I don't know if that applies to you other moms too. So I would say a superpower that I have is just being able to manage multiple things, you know, switching contexts here and there and just um, being able to like switch gears on the fly and just to readjust and like reassess and, re and prioritize accordingly. Um, so yeah. Um, so I think my superpower is actually something that other people knew about me before I knew it about myself. Um, and that is that I will and can support anyone in anything they want to do. So when I was a kid, I was, uh, the kid in elementary school who would get put in groups with like the trouble kids because I'd be so patient and supportive that I could like help the group get to the group project and you know get through it um and so for a lot of years though I didn't really realize this about myself and people were like oh you should be a teacher you should do this you should do that uh and I always was like oh what's my skill what's my thing and then actually being here at Poshmark um and noticing kind of the roles I drifted towards and uh the people that I drifted towards I kind of drifted towards the natural leaders because I wanted to support them and empower them. And I found eventually by kind of, you know, spending a lot of time looking inside that that's actually something I enjoy and I'm really good at. So um, I would say that's my, my superpower. Thank you guys for sharing. Okay, let's open it up for Q&A. If you have questions, I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, if you have questions, the mic is coming around. Um, I guess raise your hand.
Oh, Barca, do you want to come up here? You're fair game for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. I have two questions, so you can answer either or. Um, one question I have is just about how you try to maintain the company culture as you grow um, into a larger company eventually over time. The other uh, question I'm curious about is how you uh, use innovation to stay ahead of your competitors. Who are your, who are your competitors? Angela, you want to take those questions? Oh, yeah? Yeah, okay. okay. Um, so the first question about culture, um, I think for us, like you said, we're scaling so much, uh, so rapidly, not only internally, but externally. And so we have to think about both and tying back into something I said earlier, I think that the way that we make sure that we continue to scale our culture is to make sure our culture is top of mind. Because again, if you think about it, if you talk about it, um, if you embrace it, it's only going to get better and you can never forget about it. Um, so doing things like making sure we stay in touch with both our internal and external community all the time, um, even at the company here. Uh, so, you know, when I started six years ago, we were in one room and I knew everyone. I knew what they ate for dinner the night before. Um, and now that we're uh, spread out and we're on two different floors, um, it is a little bit harder. But you have to remember that, you know, we are all working together towards the same goal. So we talk to each other a lot. Um, I can still go up to anyone in the company and talk to them about anything that's happening inside or outside of the app. So um, I think, you know, again, just keeping it top of mind and always trying to think of how can we do this better has, you know, made us be able to scale our culture with the company. Yeah, um, actually, I'll, I'll do the first one too. Um, and I could go a little into the second one. So for our product features, whenever we build something, um, we look at our, what our values are and we always make sure they're, um, they're rooted in there. So we're, we're real, our CEO is really into love. I don't know if you guys have, you guys should catch some of his videos on, on YouTube, but he always says something where um, you lead with love and with love comes money. And we use that a lot in our product thinking, right? We don't, we have a like, which is a heart, but we don't have like a hate or a dislike, right? Um, like, you know how Facebook has different reactions. We always, everything is really positive. Everything is really transparent. And that goes along with a lot of our company culture as well. Everything is transparent. You can voice your opinion, um, you know what's going on at our all, our all hands, our, a lot of all the information is kind of disseminated into everyone. Um, so that's kind of how we uh, look at when we're developing products. Um, as far as our competitors, yeah, we're always checking them out. Um, they're always doing cool and unique things. But again, um, I think because we're so different, um, we have, you know, like the largest community, social shopping, social community out there. Um, we have to take a little different angle. We can't be like an eBay, right? They, they, they're very different than us. And whatever, let's say we do something similar to them, um, it may not work for us. Um, so we're always on the lookout, but we always um, search within of like what would really help our seller stylists um, as, you know, people that are they have their, they've started their own businesses on Poshmark. How can we empower them and how can we help them grow? No, 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 no. We go I was going to echo. Do we have another question? Otherwise, we can keep going. Oh, okay. Hi, I have a question about user feedback. How do you um, how do you gather that, and how do you incorporate that into the product development and innovation? Okay. okay. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, so I actually work with people like Angela, and she'll we meet with um, the community team very often. Uh, I look at our Facebook groups. Um, and we talk to our users. We go to um, PoshFest and we, uh, we're very connected to our users and we hear what's going on. Uh, and we incorporate that into our product roadmap, right? Um, I mean, there are things that our users um, may request, but they may not fit in. They, they may think that that is the solution for them. But you know, it, when we uh, internally talk about these things, 
we think, you know, one step further is like, is that really helping that? That might be one thing, but we have a larger plan and larger vision for them. Um, and I think one of the coolest things that I've done at Poshmark is each year we have um, an annual get together with our seller stylists um, called Poshfest. And um, I've been very fortunate the last couple of years to kind of announce uh, what we did for our hackathon. And so what we did is we had users submit things that they want um, in the app. And we get like, I don't know, thousands and thousands of requests. And they're like, it, the spreadsheet's crazy. Um, but I love looking at it each year because I'm like, oh, these, this is what they're interested. This is what they're passionate about. Um, and so, for example, last year, um, we were able to rehaul our newsfeed. And that, this is something that the users have wanted for so long. And they were so excited about it. Another killer feature that we launched was um, they've been always wanting a draft listing. And so we were able to launch that. So that was, that was really amazing. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm actually a Poshmark buyer, especially, and I've been a seller, but buying more than selling. Um, and so a question I have for you that I've noticed is that there is a very distinct culture um, within Poshmark. And I was wondering, how do you ensure that positive culture and thinking in like cybersecurity issues or bullying issues and things like that online, considering there's 40 million users, how do you use data or how do you think about the product or how do you build the communities to be able to continue that very specific type of culture that's already been there? And especially around cybersecurity, anti-bullying. Um. So I'll start and then Bark, if you have anything to add, let me know. Um, so we, we get this form of question quite, quite a bit. And um, the first thing I'd say is it's really hard to fake a value. Um, so when you talk about the values that are um, our unique community, um, I'd say that comes from what we want. And, and it's a little bit of the world that we wish we had before we had Poshmark. We live it here at headquarters. And it's, we intentionally said, let's also build it into the user experience and also to our, our community. And it's really hard to fake that because you have to, you almost have to be a little bit crazy about it and not know you're crazy. Um, and in that way, then you just naturally start to act in a way that's according to your values and it becomes stronger and stronger. So um, what we did is we talked a lot to Angela's point, we knew people were important to us. We knew culture is important, and not just culture here, culture in our app, in our in our community. Um, so we had that top of mind and built everything with that in mind. And we, you know, there are some times where we said this would make sense to make more money, right? But this doesn't make sense if we want to be empowering to our sellers. And so we had our north star, and we chose that path. And so if you know what your north star is, and for us, it's our it's our people, then it's easier to make those decisions when those crazy moments happen and you're panicked and you don't know exactly what to do. Um, I don't know if I can answer anything about cybersecurity. Can you, where's Chathan? Oh, <laughs> or Gotham. Uh, well, if- The only thing I would say is the, we also rely on our community to help with that, right? That's the power of this community who is very passionate. For them, Poshmark is not just a product. It's, it's their own thing. So they really help us with that too. Like uh, there's a lot of uh, comments reporting, a lot of reporting it's like what happens, which goes to Angela team. And, and of course, you have to look at it with like the, I mean, you can report anything, right? So, but that's where their team has the expertise in knowing like how to do it. But I think it's our community who's actually allowing us, allowing us to scale more than I would say the data in this case. We'll take a few more questions. Thank you. And thank you guys so much for volunteering your time to talk to us today. Um, my question is around branding, uh, especially when starting a company and starting a, um, a venture, especially social like Poshmart. How did you decide your values and how did you decide what kind of brand you were you wanted to put forward so i touched a little bit before i'll, I'll take okay i touched a little bit before about um our values and i i just to recap i think it comes from what you deeply care about and uh the founders and the founding team 
Uh, we have a lot of things in common, but I think the, the, one of the strongest things we have in common is just a belief in the way we want the world to be. So it's, it's almost outside of business and it's not just a company value, it's like our, our personal values. Um, so it comes from there. In terms of branding, I think that's a really interesting one for us. And uh, when, when it came time to really formalize our thoughts around brand, we we're a little bit confused because we're a company that wants to empower other people. And so if you create a really strong traditional brand, likely you will alienate some people. So, you know, I come from the fashion background. So my first thought was, ooh, we're going to create a really cool logo and we're going to all of our messaging and all of our images are going to look chic and sophisticated, things that you would imagine at like Net-A-Porter, for example, or just another cool brand. But we're like, yeah, but 80% of America doesn't want to see that. So what do we do then, right? And plus, all of our sellers, they have their own story. How can we possibly create a brand around our story? And, uh, you know, this is where those core values come into play. And uh, our, one of our core values in terms of how we prioritize our time is to get behind our sellers, get behind our community and make sure that we're empowering them. Um, and so when we think about brand, our brand became empowering sellers. And so when you, you know, see some of our videos or you see like where we put our energy into things that might be called brand, um, we usually don't put our faces, we put your faces, right? And we celebrate your wins. We don't really celebrate our wins because if you are, the community is winning, we, like, we know we're winning. So a lot of our brand is around community, honestly. Last question. Thank you all so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I was wondering if you have an example of a challenge that you're facing as a company right now, or maybe in the recent past. And I'm interested in hearing about what kind of problem solving methodology you use in a fast paced environment like Poshmark. Um. So I think one of the problems is scaling, right? We're getting larger. Um, our app has a lot of different things in there. We want to introduce new features, but I think the core thing is keeping it simple. We don't want it to be complicated. We don't want a million steps in the listing flow. We don't want to make um, buying complicated, right? And, but we do want to introduce new things that are useful for everyone. Um, so I think one thing we've um, introduced within the last couple of years, and um, we've introduced a concept of a meta model. Um, and what it is, is it's basically a core set of principles that you kind of adhere to when you're building a feature and really mapping it back to those, right? So if I'm going to create this button, like, does it really adhere to what we're trying to do? Um, so really sticking that and it really gets the team aligned as well. So let's say, uh, we, you know, we have a team of like 10, 10 engineers working on it, right? That helps us really stay focused and make sure that we're reaching our North star. I was just to add one thing to what Vanessa said. Um, the, the meta model is a great, a great one. Um, but really the, the problem that we're facing that led that to be the solution is that as we, we used to be a team that would sit around the table and design the product. And then we grew to 400 plus people, right? And what we found is conversations were happening all over the place about the same project in different offices. We have three other offices around the world and we had trouble. We would always try to communicate, but things would always slip between the cracks. And so that's a challenge of scale that we had is we were not talking to each other in a way that we weren't communicating. We we're talking and not communicating. So what the meta model does, and you can call it what you want, uh, but it, it gives guidelines, right? Here are the, here's the core values. Here's what, when we're doing a feature, when we're doing a project, when we're doing a campaign, here's what it should do. And so double check yourself so that we don't have to, uh, we can be more nimble as a smaller team. All right, thank you so much. Let's give them a big round of applause here.